So I'm really happy to be able to present this work today. The, the genesis of this work actually came around the time of the Dean panel in, on occupational health and safety. And I was involved in a data performance measurement group. Uh, Ron Saunders, who's one of the investigators here, was also involved in the Vulnerable Workers Task Force group. And one of the issues we, we constantly struggled with was, was the term vulnerable workers being used a lot, but often to refer to particular groups of workers um, without any real explanation of, of what it was that made these workers vulnerable. So uh, the research team for today, or the research team for, for this project, uh, comprises of um, some other investigators, Ron, Curtis Breslin and Emil Tompa, who are all based at the Institute, and Tony LaMontagne, who's at Deakin University in Australia. Uh, Marnie Lifshin has been our uh, research coordinator and Morgan Lay is the analyst. So vulnerability, what is it? So the starting point is, I guess we went to the dictionary and said, well, it's something about being at risk. So being open to damage, being capable of being uh, physically or emotionally wounded. So it's something to do with being at an increased risk of injury. Um, so that's, that's, that's useful. Um, if we think about the numbers of of articles that have referred to vulnerable workers. This is just a quick Medline search looking at vulnerable workers in the title or the abstract. You can see that it's increasing quite rapidly. We're all using the term vulnerable workers, but we potentially all have very different um, conceptions of, of what exactly that means. I'd like you to just think to yourself about what do you, who do you think of when you think about vulnerable workers? So here are some th groups that we hear about. Immigrants, young workers, temporary workers, visible minorities, small business workers, older workers, construction workers. Um, I don't know if I've missed any. Anyone else got another group they want to label as vulnerable before we, before we start? New workers? Disabled workers? OK, so, um, so yes, yeah, so short work, new workers, disabled workers, all the groups that we describe as vulnerable. And if we think about that, so worker characteristics, such as being young or being an immigrant, job characteristics such as being new, uh, being in a, a hazardous industry, <coughs> workplace characteristics such as being in the construction service or being in a small business. The problem with this, when we think about that leading to worker injury or illness, is there's a huge black box in between all these characteristics and, and the injury and illness. So labeling workers as vulnerable using either worker, job or workplace characteristics does very little to tell us about why these workers are at increased risk of injury or even how we might prevent um, these workers getting, getting injured um, at work. And so the issues that we had, we had three main issues with thinking about demographic or occupational or industry categories to describe or to define vulnerable workers. The first is that it leads to this perception that, that the risk of injury is something inherent about that group. And we, um, focused a lot about this when we uh, started doing research on younger workers in the early 2000s around people would always say, well, it's younger workers there, you know, it's, it's because there's something about being young, they take lots of risks, they don't appreciate uh, the work context. And in fact, um, there's virtually no research that suggests that, and most of it suggests that it's because they're actually in pretty crappy jobs, um, which have different characteristics, which we'll try and unpack in terms of our definition. Um, it reduces the attention to the broader conditions that lead to injury or illness. So we don't think about, well, what is it about the organisation of work or the conditions that workers have um, that leads to risk of injury or illness? We just think about, oh, it's something about that group. Um, and it provides no mechanism to measure increases or decreases in vulnerability. So what do you do when uh, we know that the, um, in a period of recession, we know that uh, short tenure workers or new workers, we, we have fewer hires, so new, the percentage of new workers goes down. Does that mean the labour market is less vulnerable? <coughs> Potentially, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it's not a, a real great indicator of, of how what's happening in the labour market around occupational health and safety vulnerability. Now, I want to share just two examples which have helped shape my, my thinking around this issue and, and thinking about why we need to go broader than just occupational or, or demographic characteristics in particular. Uh, this is a study we did in the, in the mid-2000s around um, work, rates of work injury across different job tenure categories and by age. And this was, again, one of the studies that we did, which Curtis Breslin led around focusing on young workers and, and the risk of injury. And we saw here, so at the time, there was a, a fairly common perception that, that young workers were the vulnerable group. It was something about being young um, that increased your risk of injury. And by separating it by job tenure, we could actually see that in the first month of the job, there was actually no difference in the risk of injury by age group. In fact, 
if anything, the youngest workers are actually at decreased risk compared to workers who are over the age of 25. Um, so it's about them being new, um, new on the job, not necessarily about being young. And you can see that the, over time, the rates of injury by age group, the slight change here, tended to follow around that. So it was actually the fact that young workers were more likely to be new workers than anything about them being young. And this is a more recent study where we looked at um, immigrant workers. And um, this is, was led by Stephanie Premji. Um, and in this particular study, we looked at overqualification among recent immigrants. Uh, recent immigrants, about 50% of them are overqualified based on their jobs. And so here we looked at, um, this is among male workers, and we, we had previously identified that the risk of injury was about twofold among male immigrants compared to Canadian-born immigrants, recent male immigrants compared to Canadian-born immigrants. These are odds ratios on this, which I'm presenting here. Uh, the odds ratios talk about an increased probability. So when the point estimate is above one, it means that this group is at an increased risk compared to our reference group. And the interesting point of this article is when we looked at recent immigrants who were not overqualified, there was no difference in their injury risk compared to the Canadian-born population. But when we looked at recent immigrants who were overqualified, they had a five-fold increased risk of injury. And Canadian-born workers who are overqualified also had an increased risk of injury as well. So again, it's not really about being an immigrant, that's the issue, it's about being overqualified for your job and working in conditions that you're not used to. The first part of developing a measure is developing a concept and, and coming to um, groups with what, is, what exactly do you mean by, um, by what you're trying to measure. And so our starting point in developing our concept of occupational health and safety vulnerability is that it's more than just hazards. So it's not just about the hazards that a worker is exposed to. Um, we think that's important because, one, there are some hazards, such as working at heights, that you can't, you can't necessarily take away. There are some occupations and industries that are always going to be exposed to hazards, but workers in those types of occupations or industries might have different levels of vulnerability. And so we said it's more than just hazards. So that's our starting point. So if you don't agree with that, you're not going to agree with a lot of what's coming. And so aside from hazards, we thought, well, there's, there's three other things that we think are important to shaping the risk of injury among, among workers who are exposed to hazards. So there's four dimensions in total. So level of hazards is the first. Workplace and organizational level prote protections and policies was the second dimension that we thought was important. So what is the workplace doing to either protect workers from hazards um, uh, in terms of understanding around the causes of injury in the workplace. What's, what's happening at the workplace level around protections and policies to, to protect workers from getting injured? The third was worker awareness. So awareness of occupational hazards and rights. And this sort of comes almost directly from the, the Dean Panel report where they said that if workers are aware of their rights and responsibilities, that this will in turn um, make, potentially make workplaces more likely to put in place mechanisms because they know that the workers are aware of, of the rights um, and responsibilities of their employer and of the worker. And then our last one was, was worker empowerment to participate in injury prevention. So these are things that are in place whereby workers can participate in injury prevention by either stopping work if work is hazardous, by um, communicating about risks to their employers without fear of reprisal, um, things around um, opportunities for workers to be involved with employers in, in making workplaces safer. And we saw these bottom three dimensions as, as distinct dimensions. So it's not just about that workplaces, if they scored high on policies and procedures, would necessarily score high on the others. We saw them as, as distinct dimensions that we needed to measure separately, but they were related to each other. And from there, we worked on our definition. So where workers are exposed to hazards in combination with inadequate workplace policies and procedures to protect them and or low occupational health and safety awareness and or a workplace culture that discourages worker participation in injury prevention. So that's how we've defined, how we define occupational health and safety vulnerability. And that's our starting point for starting to think about what types of questions we'll ask. So in terms of developing our measure, we, we followed a, a two-stage process. One was deal, dealt with trying to think about all the questions that we could possibly ask. So developing a pool of potential items, which we did in, with, using two methods. One was a literature search, and one was running a series of focus groups with different stakeholder groups. And then we wanted to reduce that list of items, which started up at near 100 items, to a more feasible list of about 29 items. And we did that by 
looking at the item by doing some pilot surveys and by again look, uh, getting input from our stakeholders and other investigators about the types of items that we should retain. I'm going to go through these in detail. So this was our, our literature search. So what we wanted to try and do at the start was say, well, you know, if someone else has already measured this, it's a bit of a waste of time developing a new measure just for the sake of it. And so let's sort of search the literature and see if we can find um, another measure that captures our, our definition pretty well, or even aspects of our definition. And so we ran a, a luckily through the, the support of the library staff here, which are excellent, we managed to run a, a very comprehensive literature search, which identified almost 10,000 articles. Um, we reviewed those articles, the abstracts and titles, and then we retained another 688 articles based on the abstract and title. We did a full text review of, of 83 articles, and from that full text review we extracted um, items or measures from 58 articles. So in some situations there was two articles that had used the same measure, so we didn't extract it twice. In other cases, in a small number of cases, we couldn't get a copy of the measure and we contacted the investigators but still couldn't get a copy of the measure. So we ended up with 26 articles that examined hazards, 28 that examined policies and procedures, 19 that did awareness, and 29 that did empowerment. And an article can do more than one of these um, at once. But we didn't find anything which directly matched what we wanted to do. And then we supplemented that with other measures that were known to us. So um, we had various, uh, the Worksafe Victoria in Australia had a, had a survey that, that, already, that they were put in place for a number of years around hazards, and so we looked at some of those items and saw if they were useful and other, um, other articles that had come out more recently, and we added those to our, to our list of items. The second stage was our focus groups. So we ran seven focus groups. One, uh, so we had focus groups both here in, in Ontario and also in Victoria and Australia. We ran two focus groups, one in each jurisdiction or with employees, two on, with policy makers, in each, so one in each jurisdiction with policy makers. An Ontario um, focus group was with employee, uh, uh, so that should be employers in Ontario. We had employer representatives in Victoria, so um, there's an Australian industry group, other sort of groups which, um, which uh, are sort of member organisations for employers, and we did run a focus group with them, and employee representatives who are mainly union representatives in Victoria. And so the purpose of running these focus groups was to get feedback on the conceptual framework, so if people agreed with the definition. Um, the utility of developing a measure for workers. So our starting point, again, one of our starting points was that we wanted a measure that we could administer to workers, not to workplaces, because we thought, well, workers also have potentially different perceptions of occupational health and safety risk than their employers do, and even two workers in the same workplace might have different perceptions of, of their vulnerability to injury. So we asked them about whether we, this was useful among workers, and then the types of questions they thought we should ask un, under each of our different dimensions. And so we had our literature drill, we, we had our focus group, we combined some similar items, we removed items that were clearly out of scope. We ended up with, as I said, almost 100 items, uh, 20 on hazards, 43 on policies and procedures, 20 on awareness and 14 on empowerment. We did some rankings with our investigator group and with our stakeholders around the importance of items where people got to select this is the most important item, second most, this item's the least important. Um, after that process, we ended up with 64 items, 16 on hazards, 19 on policies and procedures, 15 on awareness, and 14 on empowerment. So we had a 64 item survey, which was too long, but we thought now's the, now's the point where we can give it to a pilot sample. So we recruited 328 workers in Ontario and British Columbia, and we did this through ECOS, they've got a private panel survey. It's a panel of a, approximately 90,000 households who agree to participate in surveys from time to time uh, with ECOS. It covers both landline and cellular telephone, so it's a, got an advantage over a random digit dial sample. Um, not quite as good as a household-based survey, but household-based surveys are extremely expensive to run. The private sample itself was a little bit older than the labour force, more likely to be in health and education, social community service than the labour force, less likely to be in sales and service, which is probably a function a little bit of a function of age, and less likely to be in small businesses. We did get workers in these groups, but the, the, the distribution of our sample compared to the labour force um, was smaller in those groups. We also, as part of this survey, 
recruited a, a sample of 62 workers who did, a, who did the same survey two weeks later. Uh, and the purpose of this is to examine items that are unreliable. So when nothing changes, your response to a question should be exactly the same two weeks after you've given it. It's just long enough that you forget what you said, but it's um, long enough, well, we asked people if things had changed and they reported that nothing had changed. So we asked them to redo the, redo the survey and we could identify items there where there was a lot of variation. So it's unreliable. So it wouldn't matter what day of the week you gave it to them, you'd probably get a, a different response. And there, those items are not good. So using the pilot survey and the test retest sample, we identified items that had a high percentage of missing or not applicable responses. So this is where people didn't know, and that was 11 of those items. Items that were highly correlated to other items, so were redundant, correlations of above 0.9. Um, items that were not correlated to other items within the same dimension. So this is where we had our four different dimensions, and for three of them we expected items to work to give a little bit of unique information and a little bit of extra information, but they should be sort of related. So the items in empowerment should all try to be captured in the same construct. Um, we identified six items which were which did not fit where we thought they would. 14 items with low test retest test reliability. And this was one of the surprising findings. Items which are commonly used in many surveys are incredibly unreliable. Um, and there's virtually no information on test, test retest reliability for a lot of measures going around. And then items with floor to ceiling effects, which were identified one. So using this information, we did another round of stakeholder feedback uh, with focus group members, another round of uh, feedback from our investigator team, ranking item importance. We ended up with 29 items, 11 hazards, seven policy and procedures, six awareness and five empowerment items um, that were part of our final measure. Sorry, yes, Joe. eliminated the ones then, the two, the ones that were a high percentage of missing effect we used that information as part of our decision about whether to cut them out. So there were, as part of the final round, people could save items that were poor performers if they thought there was just something about maybe, maybe this just wasn't good in this particular sample, but I really think this is important. They could save it um, and we would keep it. But looking at it, so when you looked at the final set of items, you had a list of items, you had its performance, its item to other item correlation, item to dimension correlation, percent of missing, test retest reliability, and based on that information, you said, should we keep it or not? But generally speaking, yeah, if, if you know, 20% of the responses say this is not applicable, it's probably not gonna give you much information when you put it in. This is our final measure, and I apologize to the people at the back who can't see this, but, um, so this is our measure of hazards. So we had 11 hazard items. So we had things around lifting, things around repetitive movements, performing tasks that you're unfamiliar with, hazardous substances, working in awkward postures, experiencing pain, working at heights, working in noise, being bullied or harassed, um, having a stand for long periods of time and coming to work feeling fatigued. And in our hazard responses, people responded on how often they were exposed, being never, once a year, once every six months, every three months, every month, every week or, or every day. Only one item on bullying and harassment, we had a lot of other around the psychosocial work environment in our original measure, they were all incredibly unreliable. And so we had to remove them. Awareness, um, six items, again, on a strongly agree to disagree scale, again, referring to the workplace, being clear about their rights and responsibilities, being clear about employers' rights and responsibilities, knowing how to perform their job in a safe manner, knowing who they would report hazards to if they noticed them at work, um, saying they had the knowledge to assist in responding to health and safety concerns and knowing the necessary precautions that they should take uh, when they're doing their job. And empowerment, five items. Feeling free to voice concerns or make suggestions about safety. Um, if they noticed a hazard, if they would point it out to management, um, they, they could stop work without um, being given a hard time that if their work environment was unsafe, this is reverse scored, they wouldn't say anything and just hope it improves, and having enough time to complete their work tasks safely. So our final survey, this 29 item measure was administered to just under 2,000 employees in Ontario and British Columbia between May and June. 63% um, of these were in Ontario. We had, a, um, we had just under 1,800 respondents through the private panel, which is the panel we used, and we wanted to compare that to who we would have had had we used a ra random digit dial approach. So random digit dialing is a little bit more expensive than going to 
a group of people who will participate from time to time. But it was important to us to understand who would we get from a random digit dial approach had we used it. Response rates uh, are quite low, not unexpected. Um, the only per the only organisation who gets reasonably good response rates all the time is Statistics Canada. Um, and we did we looked at different ways to deal with our low response rate. We've used some weights for certain analyses to readjust our, our population. Um, similar selection effects to what we had in our uh, original pilot testing survey where we had fewer people than we would like in sales and service occupations, fewer younger workers, um, and more people in um, health and social support occupations, and fewer workers in small workplaces. So our objectives when we looked at our final survey was to look at the distribution of our survey audits, to explore using factor analysis if our three dimensions, our policies and procedures, our awareness and our empowerment, to explore if they were separate dimensions or whether they're all just kind of the same thing. Um, and then examine the association between demographic and labour market measures and occupational health and safety vulnerability. So just to give you some descriptive information, this is the sample with hazard exposures. The most common hazard exposure, so this is people who reported it every week or more, every week or every day, was repetitive movements, which is probably something you'd expect, um, followed by coming to work fatigued, standing for long periods of time and experiencing pain and discomfort. Uh, the least prevalent was working with unfamiliar methods, which I, I think is a positive method, positive message. Um, and interestingly, these the percentage distributions are actually quite similar to what we, unfortunately there's no um, truly uh, representative survey of hazards available in Canada. We really don't know anything about generally what the hazards that people are exposed to, but from surveys that look at one or two of these, these are actually reasonably similar to estimates you'd get from those types of surveys. Uh, respondents disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with our policy and procedure items. So the most common ones were um, receiving training when starting a job, um, the importance of occupational health and safety versus productivity, and having regular communication. The least uh, ones were about communication and prevention systems. Yes? Would you have expected a lot of internal consistency amongst the hazards? No. We, and we didn't do a factor analysis on the hazards. Because they're all, just because someone's exposed to one hazard doesn't mean they're exposed to the others. Um, respondents disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with awareness. Um, so the most, again, lower percentages than with our policies and procedures. The most common was um, responding to, being able to respond to health and safety concerns at work. Um, knowing their employer rights and responsibilities was second. Job knowledge, very few people disagreed with that and knowing the precautions, uh, again, which I think is a, a positive message. And then in terms of empowerment, um, most common one that people disagreed with was being able to stop work without being given a hard time if they thought it was unsafe, followed by not speaking out, having enough time and, and voicing concerns. So our next step was to examine the factor structure. So for our items on policies and procedures, for on awareness and on empowerment, we did a procedure which is called a factor analysis, and I'll just briefly explain that. What we're trying to do in a factor analysis is we're saying there's an underlying construct of policies and procedures. We're going to try, and that underlying construct is going to impact people's responses to our questions. And that, the level of policies and procedures should impact those questions much more than it should impact their responses to, their responses on empowerment and responses on awareness. And similarly, for awareness, if we think about that as a, a global construct, that construct should impact the items on awareness much more than it should impact the items on policies and procedures and the items on empowerment. And so what we'd hope to find um, is that we get high factor loadings for items which are within that dimension and low factor loadings for items that are without, outside of that dimension. Here's the results of the factor analysis and it worked out perfectly. So policies and procedure items all loaded on the policy and procedure factor. The awareness items all loaded on the awareness factor, and again, very, very small loadings on our other factors. And our empowerment items, with the ex potential exception of this one item is about not speaking out, which is our reverse coded item, all loaded on the empowerment, although notice that even though this is a relatively weak loading, we generally would like them to be 0.4 and above, it was still was much higher than the loadings on the other, other two dimensions. So this really supports the fact that 
These are three distinct dimensions. They are related, so correlations of around 0.6 between each of the dimensions, but they are distinct and our questions measure them, these, the particular dimension and not other dimensions that are related. And this is important because we thought from the start the reason we wanted to measure all three dimensions separately is because your approach to deal with empowerment is going to be very different to your approach to deal with awareness, which is also going to be different to your approach to deal with policy and procedures. So by measuring the dimensions separately, it gives us more information on which to base injury prevention programs and identify why certain groups are vulnerable to work injury. So here are our crude associations. In this analysis, we've weighted our sample by, by age, gender and province to reflect the labour force survey. So in terms of hazards, men were exposed to more hazards than women. Younger workers are exposed to more hazards than older workers. Non-permanent workers were exposed to more hazards than permanent workers. And workers in small workplaces are exposed to more hazards than those in large workplaces. So similar to, uh, I guess, what we would expect, although we did also have job tenure in this. We looked at the relationship between job tenure and whether workers were Canadian-born or not, and we didn't find any relationship there. Policy and procedures, men had worse scores on, on policy and procedures than, than women. Canadian-born workers had worse scores than non-Canadian-born workers, and that seems a bit counterintuitive. I think that's a sample selection effect in that we didn't get enough recent immigrants in our sample, um, which I think is based on the fact that it was primarily a, uh, a private sample where people have, have probably been in Canada for a longer period of time. Um, again, non-permanent workers had worse policy and procedures than permanent workers, and small workplaces had worse policy and procedure scores than those in large workplaces. For awareness, we didn't find any statistically significant associations between these demographic and, and occupational labour market groups. Uh, there was spread across the scale, but it wasn't different across any of the groups, which was interesting. And empowerment, again, a slightly counterintuitive finding for us anyway, was that workers in large workplaces reported worse empowerment than workers in, in small workplaces. So these are just crude, crude associations. But then we wanted to operationalise vulnerability. So how do we measure occupational health and safety vulnerability? So I'll go back to our definition, which was one of the things which guided us throughout the process. So where workers are exposed to hazards in combination with inadequate workplace policies and procedures, low awareness, or a culture that discourages participation. And so we said, well, let's s split our sample in those who are exposed to two or more hazards on a weekly basis, which is 52% of our sample, it's a high percentage because, as I said, a lot of workers were exposed to repetitive activities. Um, there were some hazards that we said if you were exposed to that hazard in isolation would include you, which is things around hazardous substances, working at heights or bullying and harassment, we said would include you, but that's 52% of our samples said they were exposed to two or more hazards. Then policy and procedure, so awareness and empowerment, we said if you disagreed with one or more items, um, we would say that was inadequate. And so we had 43% um, of our sample disagreed with one or more policy and procedure questions, 24% for awareness, and 34% for empowerment. And then using our definition, we said, well, if you're exposed to high hazards and you have negative responses to one or more of these dimensions, then we'll call you vulnerable. So um, we had 13% of our sample which were exposed to hazards and reported a negative response to one of the three dimensions, two, 10 percent which reported a negative response to two of the dimensions, and 9 percent which reported a negative response to three of the dimensions. Um, this is how we've operationalised at the moment, which led to 23, about 30 percent of our sample um, being labelled as vulnerable. Um, we'll be working on other ways to operationalise this, but this is the way we're proceeding at the moment. And just to clarify, yes. so for policies and practices, One out of the seven? Yeah. Seven questions, yeah. So there are different numbers of questions, and so that's, again, one of the challenges. Our goal in terms of defining this was not to use the sample to give us our distribution. Um, I've seen that work terribly in work stress, where it's all very sample specific, but to have a, very, a more objective measure where you could say, so you could put this into any occupational group or any population of interest and say, based on this predefined criteria, Here's who's vulnerable. So vulnerability might be, there might be no one who's vulnerable in some samples. There might be 
90% who are vulnerable in others, whereas with job stress, it's always a quarter, which is one of the real limitations of that, those measures. So demographic, occupational, and workplace variables which were associated with an increased probability of vulnerability. So this is, again, these are odds ratios. Um, so when they're above our line, this means that that group is, is more vulnerable. Um, and when they're below the line, it means they're less vulnerable. So younger workers, compared to workers who are 45 to 54 years of age, younger workers uh, were more likely to be classified as being vulnerable. Non-permanent workers um, were half as likely to be vulnerable compared to permanent workers, and workers in small workplaces. This is useful for the identification. What we would suggest is you would go further, you'd use our dimensions and say, well, how are they vulnerable? So what is it about the young workers? Is it that they're scoring high on policies and procedures and on empowerment and on awareness. Based on our studies, we suggest it's more around policies and procedures and, a, and awareness than it is around empowerment. Um, but you could use that with any of these groups. And then across industry sectors, um, we had those in agriculture, natural resources or construction, so mining and construction uh, was the most vulnerable group. Um, manufacturing and trades, healthcare, arts, accommodation, retail. So groups that you'd expect have, a, have higher injury rates and a higher um, high potential vulnerability. Again, we're detecting that with this measure. And again, we can go further by saying, now we can break that down and look at our dimensions, our three dimensions in addition to hazards and say, in what ways are these groups? And it might be the fact, we haven't done this yet, but it might be the fact that workers in particular industry groups like mining and construction are vulnerable in different ways than workers in accommodation and retail. And this other is a bit of a, a misnomer where it's people actually couldn't recall what industry they were employed in. Um, so that could be a sign of maybe uh, temporary agency workers uh, who work from different industries. Um, we're not really sure, but that's interesting as well. So, to conclude. So we've got a 29 item measure. We think it's a, it could be used to assess different dimensions of vulnerability. It could be sort of situated as a, as a leading indicator of, of occupational health and safety risk as opposed to injury rate, which is a lagging indicator. So it can be used to measure dynamic changes in the vulnerability of the labour market. Our measure demonstrates good variability across our scale and strong factorial validity, so our items are influenced what we, by what we think they're influenced by. Um, groups associated with higher vulnerability are younger workers, non-permanent employees and those in small workplaces. Future studies, we want to examine uh, how our measure performs in harder to reach samples. So one of the limitations of our survey was that we, we couldn't get at recent immigrants. We had a lot of trouble getting at workers who were in the very early part of their employment relationship. And we ended up having a group workers who were six months or less, and we know that the risk is highest in those first two months. Um, and other, other groups, which just to see if the measure still performs as well. Um, just to acknowledge, um, the Institute is supported by the province of Ontario. This particular work was supported by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Institute for Safety, Compensation and Recovery Research in Australia. Um, I'm happy to send copies, just please email me, and now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.